Hi everyone. Okay, this video is about magnetic fields. Um, Realise there isn't a great deal of uh, uh, simplistic videos um, explaining how magnets produce fields and what happens to them in certain circumstances. So I thought I'd do you a video. On this piece of page I have a very simplistic view of a magnet. North side, south side. Uh, pretty much like that. That group of magnets that I've got there, these are neodymiums. You'll recognise them. These are only small. They are um, 10 mil by 20 by 5 mil. These ones are nice small magnets. Um, use them quite a lot if I can get them apart. There we go. As you can see on that one, that's the north face. So, what happens to this magnet? How do the fields look around it? Because you can't see the field at all. Uh, get my ruler away from it. No, nope. can anyone see the field? No, nope. right. So, let's have a go at explaining it in simple terms so that you can grasp the concept. So from the north side, which is typically how um, it's thought of, the field comes around, goes around to the south side. So if I draw the lines, can you see that? Oh, barely. Oh, good. Definitely need to sharpen this pencil. Looks a bit like that. And the next one. Just drawing them as, as simple lines indicating the um, gradient of the magnetic field. That's that one. Now on this side, it's easier for the, for the, for the field Come this way round, and someone's just sent me a text message. So it kind of looks like that. It's a bit more symmetrical than how I've drawn it, but you get the idea. And so it's not like a mushroom that most people think about it. Right. Um, have I got anything to show you? No, I haven't. Who? Oh well. But anyway, most people think of the mushroom being that way around. A, a sphere all around the magnet, and it's not. And you end up with this sort of weird donut effect with the magnetic field. Now, what happens if you introduce a second magnet? So we're going to draw a second magnet here. Just bear with me. You can tell when someone does it live that you know they thought about it. Again, sorry, north, south. There we go. So we've got two there. Let's get rid of the original lines, shall we? Uh, well, actually, looking at it, we probably only need to get rid of. These two. Let's take it all the way around to about there. So the back side of this magnet on this side and the back side of that magnet isn't affected. Or we're not going to show that for the time being. So again, yeah, the curl around the edges there on this magnet. Get the next one out. Right. Two fields don't intersect yet, do they? Nope. What happens when they intersect? It 
don't know if I can draw this properly. It kind of looks weird. Aha, that's probably the worst drawing I've ever done. <laughs> Hang on. Sorry. One moment. It only takes a jet. That looks a bit better. Right, when the two fields intersect with each other, north versus north or south versus south, they begin to flatten, as you can see. Right, so as you push them closer, you get this weird voidy bit in the middle, which does all sorts of funky crap. Um, but then you also get the flattening of the donut field. So, what happens if you then take it even closer? Well, when you push two magnets together, you can try this yourselves. I'll show you in front of the camera. And on there. Oh, that's south side, spin it around. These are rectangular magnets, so they like to misbehave. Ow! Bugger! That hurt. Try that again. Ow! Insert swear word. Stop it. Right. I've grabbed them a little bit more firmly this time. Okay. When you first put them together, you can feel that the fields are intersecting. You can feel them rubbing against each other. That, that's right on the edge. That's where they begin to start deforming. If you push them even closer together, you feel a point. It's right about there. And it feels like you're pushing a brick wall. All right. And push them together, push them together, right about there. So, what happens at that point? Shall we draw it? Well, let's flip it over. Quick, simplistic view of a magnet. Oops. One magnet. Draw the other one right about here. Yeah, I know it's not proportionate, but never mind. You'll get the idea. So, again, north, south, north, south. So the norths are pointing at each other. Well, quite simply, if we follow the style that I did in the first drawing and draw in the gradient lines we get some very weird effects going on so first gradient line from here does something like that and this one also gets flattened and then same here around and like that there. You know, second gradient line kind of does that. And you'll note at these points here, the gradient lines are closer together, a lot closer together. Right. Now, the gradients in the middle 
kind of do some really weird things. They flatten considerably, but more to the point. Oh gold, that's all gone wrong. <laughs> oh well. That one's probably the better one. More to the point, they begin to start touching each other, so you get a really severe uh, gradient between the fields. So the next one, literally again, comes out and around. I'll draw it on this side since I've made a complete hash up of it. On the other side. Anyway, here, again, very, very close together, but more to the point, it spits the magnetic field out sideways because it compresses it and then pushes it up. So it compresses it here and spits it out with force that side. Right. Now, if you were to push them even closer together, as a lot of people do, they have found that certain magnets will then stick to each other north to north. Which, if you think about it, at first you'll see that's extremely odd. And it's like, that can't be possible, the ma magnet must be damaged, etc. It's not. What happens is, you collapse these fields to the point where they have no choice but to go through the other magnet. Uh, putting it in simplistic terms, my apologies. So they then travel through the magnet to come back around. And that's where you can get some really big issues. Now, in the terms of a coil... Yes, oh, don't worry, I'm not wasting paper. I'll, I'll rub it out in a bit. After I've done the video. What happens to the magnetic field from a drive coil? Again, simplistic terms. Here's enough one. Oops, there you are. One magnet. Okay, let's do the coil. Seriously, get your fingers out of the way. Right. Can you see it? Yep. I'll shade it in a touch for you. Just so you can see it. Yeah, you can see it. That's just a simplistic view of the core of your coil. I'm not going to draw the coils on, it's completely pointless. Again, actually, you know, I will draw the coils on. I've just had a thought. I'm going to leave the core exposed a touch. Most people don't do that, they butt the, the, uh, the cores up. I'm just going to do a simplistic view of a cross section. Like that. Right. Let's assume these white bits are where you put put the um, turns around your drive coil. <clears throat> so you're in repulsion mode. So you create an electromagnetic north at that point. Right. What's the simplistic view? Is it, is it a Mushroom shape? Nope. It's the same thing. But what happens here is you've got all your windings in here. And each and every one of them creates their own magnetic field. So the field from your coil actually comes around the outside of your coil and around to the south side. 
kind of does that. Pretty much the same as a magnet. So when you're repulsing the magnet on your rotor, what happens is more or less that it doesn't matter the orientation which way uh, the magnet's rotating round it's north to north it's a cross section through both of them so it doesn't matter whether you're looking um, if your rotor's horizontal or vertical whichever way you're looking at it it's just a cross section so when you're in repulsion right, it's these fields here that are intersecting and you're squishing the gradients that spits the magnet out that's why you can well most pulse motor setups you can spin the rotor in either direction and it'll still work so that's the ideal setup if you get it too close again as I showed with two normal magnets right, the fields start deforming to the point where um, they really start sort of bending all over the place right, and get spat out the side and generally causes um, well if you do it too much you can get the electromagnetic waves breaking away from the magnet and then you get all sorts of weird things going on. Some of my videos you will actually see um, where I'm doing an experiment in the garage. Uh, my, f my mobile phone, when I use it, is in an aluminium case. And you can actually see the mag electromagnetic radiation bouncing off the aluminium case and causing a visual distortion in front of the camera. It is there, you have to look for it. Um, it's the really weird effect uh, where the image starts shimmering. It sometimes happens in, in here as well at my desk. Um, not quite sure why that is. I think it's uh, the UPSs that are in here. Uh, but again, that's besides the point. And again, this one, just to show you on the drive coil, right, this one kind of distorts like a really weird sort of triangle kind of does that to show you just to exaggerate the effect not 100% accurate sorry I'm trying to explain it so that the beginners can understand this so that's pretty much the effects that happens now there's another one I want to show you this one's hard to draw so I will do my best um, I've forgotten his name, actually, to be honest. Uh, once I've drawn this, I will uh, look it up. You know, I'm kind of glad I muted my speakers. Someone's just sent me a rook load of messages. Right, so north, south, north, south. Can you see them? Yep. Hang on, I'm going to redraw that one. <laughs> Otherwise, it'll just look totally. Bar. <laughs> Sorry, hang on. It's always best to, uh, well, in my opinion, I find it always best to uh, draw stuff out like this rather than like doing it on a computer or printing it out. I do that too from time to time. 
and especially if something gets complicated where it would take me half an hour to draw it by hand. Right, that's looking a bit better. North, south, let's have a look. Yep, you can see it. If you place two magnets like this, you get some interesting effects going on. Right. Um, the user... Do I have this guy? I looked at his channel last night, I think it was. Well, that's embarrassing. I can't seem to find it again. No. Right, I'll have a look for it after I've finished the video. Um, my apologies um, for not mentioning you in the video. Um, I will put it in the comments, honest. I'll I'll try and find uh, uh, the link that I looked at last night um, and your video. Okay, so we've got two magnets, 45 degrees from each other uh, and the tail ends are quite close together when I say tail ends the bottom ends now if there is a gap there which you might not want to put one right, the fields here what perfect timing probably the posty two fields here that's really bad Hang on. Let's try this again. Fields down at the bottom end kind of do that. You can see how they're distorted like pear drops. Wonderful. The next field will come round and it'll get squished like that form. More pear drops, but when you have them close enough together, right, the magnetic field lines here will stop. They won't pass through the centre of the magnets. What actually happens is, if I draw it out for you, Try to draw it symmetrically. You can see as I'm as I'm drawing it out and working out the field in my head. kind of goes off the page at this point but you can see that the gradients get squeezed into this bit and blasted out for want of a better way of putting it so you end up with a fountain you greatly extend the field produced by two magnets. If you stack them one on top of each other, you only get probably a 50% extension to the field. But if you put them at 45 degrees like that, you get huge. You get double and a bit more if you do it right. Obviously, it depends on the grade of the magnets and how well they've been constructed. If you buy cheap, you get cheap, etc., etc. So, concept that most people don't realise. As I said, um, I watched a video from a guy last night. Um, what was it last night? Can't remember. It was sent to me by uh, Mr. Angus Wangus. Um, thank you, bud. Um, where he proposes on his next rotor to use two magnets... Um, I don't don't know if he was actually intending to make them 45 degrees or whether that's the way they looked on his video. <coughs> um, but still, I thought, brilliant. 
worth doing worth doing a video about okay so experimentation with these uh, gus fields is always a good idea now you can buy gus meters you can make your own um, most people haven't done this research uh, most people don't realize how these magnets operate now differences in magnets you've got a load of magnet types oh, no north marking on that one oh well neodymium commonly used come here I'm going to remove this otherwise we'll end up with an accident um, the old style speaker magnets um, are basically compressed I think it's iron ferrite yes I'm pretty sure it's iron ferrite that one's a speaker magnet That the magnetic field from this as most people have found out does some really weird things because it curls around on the inside up to a point but then it acts like a focusing from multiple magnets so you end up extending the field as it sits on the desk vertically and then out which is why sometimes these are preferred and then you also get give these sort of flexible strip magnets that come out of uh, like PC fans and whatnot I also use magnets for going on fridges as well um, what I don't have to show you because of the cost involved is the um, cobalt ones which are um, extremely dense so what's the difference with them um, well going back to that type um, basically the field is not able to be um, as dense as say a neodymium right? but the field expands further it has a bigger sphere of in influence with the magnetic field but it's not as dense so it's not as strong right? and it can't relatively speaking uh, in terms of gus values it can't be energized as high as a neodymium and likewise a neodymium can't be energized as high as a cobalt so neodymiums very dense right? the magnetic field is dense packed close to the magnet right? so its sphere of magnetic influence isn't as big which is why sometimes it's better to use an iron um, uh, compressed iron uh, magnet like the one I just showed you the ring magnet rather than a neodymium however um, I produced a topic on this ages ago I think it was two years ago um, you can alter a magnet's physical dimensions and it changes the physical sphere of magnetic influence also the shape of the magnet as well right. the way that I've drawn these is if they were cylindrical magnets obviously the magnets that I've got are all rectangular so the magnetic field will always follow the easiest path from north to south even if it's through conducting through other objects or other magnets so the deeper for example the deeper the magnet is right, the more it's got to curl around so it expands its sphere right. but in a rectangular magnet or let's take a square magnet less of the magnetic field goes over the corners if you put a dot right in the center of the magnet on say the north face less field goes over a corner than it will do the closest flat edge right, so you get um, a difference in the magnetic field with square magnets rectangular magnets versus say a cylindrical 
even the um, even magnets like these it also depends on how it's polarized. But when I say spherical magnet, I mean if that end was polarized. Now these things, uh, commonly found in uh, water pumps, etc., are polarized around the curved faces. They have a similar effect between north and south, um, but it's a bit more complicated. So um, yeah, we, we, we won't go into that. It just gets really. Uh, you can look them up anyway. All of this information is, of course, already been produced online. It's just no one seems to reference it. A rectangular magnet, um, as I said, with a square magnet, the magnetic field will is easiest to flow over the nearest flat side. So it's the shortest route. So with a rectangular magnet, less field flows um, around the long edges, uh, the short edges rather, than it would around the long edges. So it takes the shortest path. But because of the gradients it actually pushes it out but at a lower density around the sides I hope that makes sense <laughs> um, you can get some impressive magnetic fields and um, things like the um, the roding coils the uh, Tesla pancake coils Mapping them out is just like um, it's difficult to do. Let's put it that way. Um, and especially the roading coil. That's um, don't even ask me to draw that out because that would be a nightmare. Because the coil itself is not only rotated but it's in three dimensions as well. Um, so, but inevitably, um, you get a very tight, in both those types of coils, you get um, a tight magnetic field around the wire, and you get um, not only a focusing, where's the camera gone, not only a focusing, bit like that but it also the field hits each other goes parallel and comes back out again so it, a bit like that but it's you have to think of it in three dimensions and there's no way I can describe it drawing it two dimensionally without drawing a billion and one diagrams um, so yes, wonderful effects from them. Um, there's very few people that I've seen that attempt to draw out the fields and explain them. And to be honest, I perfectly understand when it comes to Tesla coils, uh, sorry, Tesla coils, pancake coils, and uh, the Rodins. What should I say? Rodin slash Starship slash whatever else they want to call them hope that explains things uh, for people to understand any questions at all give me a shout and we're up to 34 minutes so that's another long video hopefully um, that will explain a few things to people as well and, and help them to understand what actually happens in a pulse motor now that's not the only use for these types of diagrams DC motors um, if you think of this pattern right, and the other one that I drew with putting two magnetic fields together you can then work out how DC motors work, how AC motors work um, also the uh, magnet only motors right. now you know how they work if you draw out on a piece of paper I, should, I really should do that sometime that would be so cool. Draw out on a piece of paper the placement for all the magnets. 
draw the fields around them and then take another piece of paper like tracing paper or something so you can see through it and pin it to this piece of paper, the back piece of paper draw on it where the magnet would be for the rotor draw its field around it and then you can rotate it round and see how it interfaces or not with the other magnets and the best thing is if you then apply what I've just said to that you can actually get a slightly more efficient um, uh, magnet only motor and hopefully really can you please stop messaging me I'm trying to do a video I can I can see it's it's one of those things now I'm always going to get messaged constantly never be able to do a video without being interrupted again so hopefully you can use something like this I believe uh, who was it oh no I've forgotten that train carriage thing um, with the uh, magnets that push it down the track is it Howard Johnson? That rings a bell. Why does that ring a bell? Yes, I think I think it was. Um, if you apply this to that model, right, you will understand how the magnetic fields push the train. Because basically they create sort of um, a pressure field, so to speak, behind it. And in, in sort of repulsion mode right? and then it funnels all the gust fields down the track simplest way I can put it anyway we're up to 38 minutes again or coming up for it so I'm going to let you get on um, hopefully I haven't caused too many heads to explode uh, hopefully that makes sense to people uh, as always any questions give me a holler Talk to you later.